concerned about cybersecurity. Might I ask my colleague another question on uh, one other topic? He and I have talked about at great length. Is the senator from Kentucky troubled by the fact that a number of high-ranking intelligence officials have not been forthright in recent years with respect to this bulk collection and the collecting of data on millions or hundreds of mil millions of Americans. My colleague knows I've been particularly troubled by this. And I asked the question because my colleague and I have pointed out that we have enormous admiration for the rank and file in the intelligence field. These are individuals who day in and day out get up in the morning and contribute enormously to the well-being of the American people. And we have enormous respect for them. We are grateful to them. They are patriots, and they serve us every day well. I personally do not think they have been well served by the fact that a host of high-level intelligence officials have not exactly been straight or forthright with the Congress and the American people on these issues. And I would be interested in my colleagues' view on that because we have discussed this at, at some length, and I'm, I'm glad to be able to put it in the context of making sure that Americans know that the two of us greatly respect the thousands of people who work in the intelligence field, serve us well, do the things that are necessary to apprehend and kill bin Laden, but that we are concerned about the question of the veracity, the uh, forthrightness of some of the members of the intelligence community at the highest levels. What's my, my colleague's uh, reaction to that? I think the vast majority of the intelligence community, like the vast majority of policemen, are good people, trying to do what's best for the country. They're patriotic people, and they're uh, really trying to do things within the confines of the law. But the thing is, is that the intelligence community has such vast power and a lot of its secret power. So you have to have a great deal of trust for those who run the agency because we've entrusted them with such enormous power to look through information that if we lose the trust at the top, then when they come to us and say, well, you have to give up a little more liberty, you have to give up a little bit more in order to get security, we have to trust the information because they control all the information they give us and that we find when you ask a high-ranking official in the committee whether or not they were doing bulk collection of data and the answer was not true, that they said we weren't doing something that we obviously are doing, it makes us distrust the whole, the whole apparatus. But I agree with you that the vast majority of law enforcement, intelligence community, they're good people, patriotic. They want to stop terrorism. We all do. But what we're arguing about is the process and the law and the Constitution and trying to do it within the confines of the Constitution. But when you have someone at the very top who doesn't tell the truth in an uh, open hearing under oath, that's very troubling and makes it difficult. I appreciate uh, my colleague's assessment of that, and he knows that it was very troubling that in 2012 and 2013, we just weren't able to get straight answers to this question of collecting data on millions or hundreds of millions of Americans. As my colleague will recall, uh, the former NSA director said that he had been to a conference and that he was not involved in collecting dossiers on millions of Americans. And having been on the committee at that point for over a dozen years, I said, gee, I'm not exactly sure what a dossier means in that context. So we began to ask questions both public ones, to the extent you could, and private ones, about exactly what that meant. And we couldn't get answers to those questions. 
just couldn't get answers. So the Intelligence Committee traditionally doesn't have many open hearings. By my calculus, we probably get to ask questions in an open hearing for maybe 20 minutes maximum a year. So after months and months of trying to find out exactly what was meant, we felt it was important to ask the Director of National Intelligence exactly what it was meant by these dossiers and the government collecting data and the like. So at our open hearing, I said I'm going to have to ask the Director of National Intelligence about it. And because I've long felt that it was important not to try to trick people or ambush them or anything of the sort, we sent the question in advance to the head of national intelligence. We sent the exact question, does the government collect any type of data at all on millions of Americans? And we asked it so that he would have plenty of time to reflect on it. And we waited to see if the director got back and said, please don't ask it. There's always been a kind of informal you know, tradition in the Intelligence Committee, being respectful of that. We didn't get that request, so I asked it. And the director said, when I asked, does the government collect any type of data at all on millions of Americans, the director said no. And I knew that that wasn't accurate. That was not a forthright, straightforward, truthful answer. So we asked for a correction. Couldn't get a correction. I would say to my colleague, since that time, the director or his representatives have given five different reasons why they responded as they did, further raising questions in my mind with respect not to the rank and file in the intelligence community, the thousands and thousands of hardworking members of the intelligence community that my colleague and I uh, feel so strongly about and respect so greatly. So I'd like to ask just one other question with respect to where we are at, at this point and what's ahead. As long as the senator from Kentucky holds the floor, no one would be able to offer a motion to consider an extension of the USA Patriot Act. But at some point in the near future, whether it's this weekend or next week or next month, my analysis is the proponents of bulk phone record collection are going to seek a vote in the Senate to continue what I consider to be this invasion of privacy of millions and millions of law-abiding Americans. When that happens, I intend to use every procedural tool available to me to block that extension. And at least 40, and if at least 41 senators stand together, we can block that extension and block it indefinitely. If 41 senators stick together, there isn't going to be any short-term extension. And finally, after something like eight years of working on this issue, finally, we will be saying no to bulk phone record collection. I'm certain I know the answer to this question, but I think we both want to be on the record on this matter. When that vote comes, the senator is going to be one of the 41 uh, senators who is going to block that extension. I've appreciated his leadership, and I would just like his reaction to our efforts to go forward once again when we have to uh, do it with proponents 
of mass surveillance seeking an actual vote to continue business as usual with respect to dragnet surveillance. I think the American people are with us. I think the American people don't like the idea of the bulk collection. I think the American people are horrified, and I think it will go down in history as one of the most important questions we've asked in a generation when you ask the Director of National Intelligence, are you gathering bulk, are you gathering in bulk the phone records of Americans? And when he didn't tell the truth, and then when the President kept him in office, and how this led to this great debate we're having now. I think the American people are with us. I don't think uh, that those inside Washington are listening very well. So I think those inside Washington have not come to the conclusion yet. But I think you're right. There may be enough of us now to say, hey, wait a minute, you're not going to steamroll through once again something that really isn't even doing what you said it was going to do. No one said at the time of the Patriot Act that it meant we could collect all the records of all the Americans all the time. In fact, in the House, one of the co-sponsors of the bill, James Sensenbrenner, he knew all about the Patriot Act. He was a proponent of the Patriot Act, and he said never in his wildest dreams did what he vote for, did he ever think that that would say that we could gather all the records all the time. But I am interested in one, another question, and this would be whether the senator from Oregon has a question that will help us better to understand if we were to stop bulk collection tomorrow, if we were going to eliminate what's called Section 215 of the Patriot Act, if we were to do that, is there still concern and worry about what's called executive order? what's called Executive Order 12333. And I'm not aware of whether you can or can't talk about this or what is public. From what I have read in public and from what um, one of the insightful articles was from John Napier Ty, the chief for the Internet Freedom and the State Department Bureau, has written that his concern is that this executive order may well allow a lot of bulk collection that is not justified and not given sanction under the Patriot Act. If you have a question that might help the American public to understand that. I would just say to my colleague that we always have to be vigilant about secret law. And we have, in effect, found our way in this ominous cul-de-sac that you and I have been describing here this afternoon, really because of secret law. And I want the American people, as I wrap up with this question and hear my colleagues concerned about it, because I think that's what is at the heart of his question, that secret law is what the interpretation is in the intelligence community of the laws written by the Congress, and very, very often those secret interpretations are very different than what an American will read if they use their iPad or their, their laptop. For example, on Section 215, bulk phone record uh, collection, I don't think very many people in Kentucky or Oregon sat and took out their laptop and read the Patriot Act and said, oh, that authorizes collecting all the phone records on millions of law-abiding Americans. There's nothing that even suggests something like that. But that was a secret interpretation. So I am very glad that the senator from Kentucky has chosen to have us wrap up at least this part of our uh, discussion with the questions that we have directed to each other on this question of secret law. Because as my colleague from Kentucky and I have talked about, we both feel that operations of the intelligence community, what are called sources and methods, they absolutely have to be secret and classified. Because if they're not, Americans could die. 
Patriotic Americans who work in the intelligence community could suffer grievous harm if sources and methods and the actual operations were in some way leaked to the public. But the law should never be secret. The American people should always know what the law means. And yet, with respect to bulk collection and why that court decision was so important, what happened was a program that had been kept secret, that had been propped up by secret law, was declared illegal by an important court. So I will just wrap up by way of saying that the senator from Kentucky and I have always done a little kidding over the years about our informal Ben Franklin caucus. Ben Franklin always talking about how anybody who gave up their liberty to have security really didn't deserve either. And I just want to tell my colleague that I'm very appreciative of his involvement in this from the time that my colleague came to the Senate. He has been a very valuable ally in this effort. And my colleague recognized this was not about balance, this program. This is a program that doesn't make us safer, but compromises our liberty. It's not about balance. And at page 104, you can read that the president's own advisors say that. So I'm very pleased that the informal Ben Franklin caucus is back in action this afternoon. I look forward to working closely with my colleague on this. And as I indicated by my question, I expect we'll be back on the floor of this wonderful body here before long, having to once again tackle this question of whether it ought to be just business as usual and re-up of a flawed law. And my colleague and I aren't going to accept that. And I thank him for his work, uh, work today, these uh, discussions and being on your feet hour after hour, not for the faint-hearted. And I appreciate my colleague's leadership, and I once again yield the floor back to him. Well, Mr. President, I would like to thank the uh, senator from Oregon, and I'd also like to point out to the American people that people are always crying out, and they were saying, why can't you work together? Why can't you work with the other side? And I think we have a false understanding sometimes of compromise. The senator from Oregon is from the opposite party. We are on two opposite parties, and we don't agree on every issue. But when it comes to privacy and the Bill of Rights and what we need to do to protect the Fourth Amendment, we're not splitting the difference to try to find a middle ground between us. We both believe in the Fourth Amendment. We both believe in protecting the Fourth Amendment and protecting your right to privacy. So bipartisanship can be about two people believing in the same thing, just being in different parties. And it means we may not believe on 100% of issues, but on a few, we're exactly together. And we don't split the difference. It isn't always about splitting the difference. You can have true, healthy bipartisanship, Republican, Democrat, Independent, coming together about a constitutional principle, coming together about something that's important. And I didn't come to the floor today because, you know, I want to get, uh, you know, some money for one individual project for one person. I came because I want something for everybody. I want freedom for everybody, and I want the protection of the individual. I want protection uh, against the government's invasion into your privacy. And so I thank the senator from Oregon for his uh, insightful questions. One of the things that uh, we talked a little bit about as uh, Senator Wyden and I were going through a series of questions was some of the different boards that have been um, put in place by the president and uh, have come out with and said that the program, uh, the executive order, The president put in place two sort of panels, a, a review panel, and then another one called the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board. 
And interestingly, both panels told him the same thing, that what he was doing was illegal and wrong, and it ought to stop. And then the president will come out and say, that's great, but then he just keeps doing it. So I don't, I don't quite understand, because I like the president, and I take him at his word, and he says, well, yes, I'm balancing this and that, and they told me this, and yes, if Congress stops it, I'll obey Congress. It's like, we didn't start this. The president started this program by himself. He didn't tell us about it. Maybe one or two people knew about it. Almost all of your representatives didn't know about it. No Americans knew about it. And then when we asked them about it, they lied to us and said they weren't doing it. So the president has two official panels, and they both say it's illegal and ought to stop. And that the Patriot Act, even the Patriot Act, doesn't justify what they're doing, and that this was all created by executive order. So what is the president's response? He just keeps collecting your records. Does nobody in America think that this is strange or unusual, that the president will continue a program that his own advisors tell him is illegal, that the courts have now said is illegal, and he goes on? But this isn't all one-sided. That's, on, that's for one political party. But in my political party, there are people saying, hmm, well, I guess the president's advisors say it's illegal. The court says it's illegal. But man, they're not collecting enough. I just wish they were collecting more of Americans' records without a warrant. What a bizarre world that people don't seem to be listening either to the courts, to the experts, or to the Constitution. The Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board, though, I think uh, really had some insightful comments here. They give a description, first of all, of collecting all of your phone records. And I like the way they put it. They said that an order was given such that the NSA is to collect nearly all call detail records generated by certain telephone companies in the United States. Sometimes you read the sentence and you don't quite get to the importance. Nearly all. So we're not talking about a thousand records. We're not about talking about a million records. We're, not, we're talking about nearly all of the records in the entire United States. There's, there's probably over 100 million phones, I would think, in the United States. I'm talking about 100 million records. Every record's got thousands of uh, pieces of information in it. So we're talking about billions of bits of information that the government's collecting. And I don't have a problem if they want to collect the phone data of terrorists. In fact, I want them to. I don't have a problem if they will go a hundred hops into the data if they've got a warrant. If John Doe's a warrant, look at all his phone records. Ask a judge, put his name on the warrant, look at all of his records. If a hundred people that he called, there are people that you have suspicion on, call them too. I mean, uh, get a warrant for them, go into the next hop, go into the next hop. There's no limit, but just do it appropriately do it appropriately with uh, a warrant, with somebody's name on it. I see no reason why we can't do this with the Constitution. We are now collecting the records of hundreds of millions of people without a warrant. And I think it needs to stop. The president's own commission says it should stop. Here's what the commission said. From 2001 through early 2006, the NSA collected bulk data based on a presidential authorization. So interestingly, and this ought to scare you too, they didn't even use the Patriot Act in the beginning at all. The president just wrote a note to the, the head of the NSA and said, just start collecting all their stuff without any kind of warrant. And then later on they started saying, well, maybe the Patriot Act justifies this. But for five years they collected data with no warrant and with no legal justification. And they do it through something they call the inherent powers of the president, Article II powers. The Article II is the section of the Constitution that gives the president powers. We designate what the president can do. Article I designates what we can do. Interestingly, our framers put Article I first, and those of us in Congress think that maybe they thought the powers of Congress were closer to the people and more important. And they gave delegated powers to us, and they were very, very specific. But what concerns me about the bulk collection 
is that for five years it wasn't even done with regard to the Patriot Act. I'm guessing it was done under the executive order. So as much as I don't like the Patriot Act and I would like to repeal the Patriot Act and simply use the Constitution, I'm afraid that even if we repealed the Patriot Act, they'd still do what they want. Your governments have run amok. Things are run away, and the government really is not paying attention to the rule of law. For the first time in 2006 is when the court got involved. The intelligent court at that time finally gives the first order under Section 215. So for five years, they were collecting all the phone records with just a presidential order. Now we do it under the Patriot Act. But the rule of law is about checks and balances. It's about balancing the executive branch and the legislative branch, the judiciary branch. It's about balancing the police and the judiciary. We talked about warrants and the police not writing warrants. And I see on the floor one of probably the nation's leading experts in the Fourth Amendment and the Constitution, who's recently written a book on this. And I was, uh, I've told him recently, I've, I've, I've been stealing his story and at least half the time giving his credit for it. But I talked earlier on the floor about the story of John Wilkes and uh, if the senator from Utah is interested in, in telling us a little bit of the story, we'd probably like to hear a little bit from his angle or in the form of a question, any other question he has. Let me clear, be clear at the outset that uh, while the senator from Kentucky and I come to different conclusions uh, with regard to the specific question as to whether we should allow Section 215 of the Patriot Act to expire, I absolutely stand with the junior senator from Kentucky, and more importantly, I stand with the American people. With regard to the need for a transparent, open amendment process and for an open, honest debate in front of the American people on the important issues facing our nation, including this one. And I certainly agree with the senator from Kentucky that the American people deserve better than what they're getting. And quite frankly, it's time that they expect more from the United States Senate. On issues important as this one, on issues as important as the right to privacy of our citizens and our national security, this is not time for more cliffs, more secrecy, and more 11th hour backroom deals that are designed amidst conflict, amidst crisis, in a previously arranged time crunch in which the American people are presented with something where they don't really have any real options. It's time for the kind of bipartisan, bicameral consensus that I believe is embodied in the USA Freedom Act. And while I often criticize Congress for our economic deficits, our financial deficits, the core of this current challenge we face is centered around the Congress's deficit of trust. And in this particular circumstance, the Senate's deficit of trust. Members of our body routinely tell the American people to just trust us. Just trust us, we'll get it right. Just trust us, we'll appropriately balance all the competing concerns. And I think it's time that we trust the American people by having an honest discussion with them emanating from right here on the floor of the United States Senate. It's time to discuss and to debate and to amend the House-passed USA Freedom Act. I'm confident that Senator Paul and others among my colleagues who have different ideas from mine will be happy to offer and debate amendments to improve it and to make it something perhaps that they could even support. In fact, uh, as far as I'm aware, uh, Senator Paul and others have amendments that they're eager and anxious and willing and ready to present and to have discussed here on the floor and voted on right here on the floor of the United States Senate. So first I'm calling on my Republican and Democratic colleagues to help repair the dysfunctional legislative branch we've inherited to rebuild the Senate's reputation as not only our nation's but the world's greatest deliberative body and by extension slowly restore the public's confidence in who we are and what we're here to do here in the United States Senate. The greatest challenge to policymaking today is perhaps distrust. 
The American people distrust their government, and they distrust Congress in particular, and it's not without reason. For their part, Washington policymakers seem to distrust the people. And almost as pressing for the, for the new majority here in the United States Senate, the distrust that now exists between grassroots conservative activists and elected Republican leaders can be particularly toxic. Leaders can respond to this kind of distrust in one of two ways. One option involves the bare-knuckled kind of partisanship that the previous Senate leadership exhibited over the last eight years, twisting rules, blocking debate, and blocking amendments, while systematically disenfranchising hundreds of millions of Americans from meaningful political representation right here in this chamber. But this is no choice at all. Contempt for the American people and for the democratic process is something Republicans should oppose in principle. And in fact, it is something we oppose in principle. We should throw open the doors of Congress, throw open the doors of the Senate, and restore genuine representative democracy to the American Republic. What does this mean? Well, it means no more cliff crises, no more secret negotiations, no more take it or leave it deadline deals. No more passing bills without reading them. No more procedural manipulation to block debate and compromise. These are the abuses that have created today's status quo, the very same status quo that Republicans have been elected to correct. What too few in Washington appreciate and what the new Republican majority in Congress must appreciate if we hope to succeed is that the American people's distrust of their public institutions is totally justified. There is no misunderstanding here. Americans are fed up with Washington and, and they have every right to be. The exploitive status quo in Washington has corrupted Americans' economy and their government and its entrenched defenders, powerful, and sometimes rich in the process. This situation was created by both parties, but repairing it is now going to fall to those of us in this body right now. It's our job to win back the public's trust, and that can't be done simply by passing bills, or even better bills. The only way to gain trust is to be trustworthy. I think that means that we have to invite the people back into the process to give the bills we do pass the moral legitimacy that Congress alone no longer confers. So in order to restore this trust, members will have to expose themselves to inconvenient amendment votes, inconvenient debate and discussion and scrutiny of legislation that we're considering. The results of some votes and the fates of certain bills may indeed prove unpredictable. But the costs of an open source transparent process are worth it for the benefits of greater inclusion and more diverse voices and views, and for the opportunity such a process would offer to rebuild the internal and the external trust needed to govern, needed to govern with legitimacy. My friend and colleague, the junior senator from Kentucky, has referred to a story of which I've become quite fond, a story that I've written about and talked about in various venues throughout my state and throughout America. It relates to a lawmaker, a lawmaker who served several hundred years ago, a lawmaker named John Wilkes. Not to be confused with John Wilkes Booth, Lincoln's assassin. This John Wilkes served in English Parliament in the late 1700s. In 1763, John Wilkes found himself at the receiving end of anger and resentment by the administration of King George III. King George III and his ministers were angry with John Wilkes. You see, because at, at the time, there were these weekly news circulars, weekly news magazines that went out and would often just extol the virtues of King George III and his ministers. One of them was called The Briton. The Briton was, was written and produced and published by those who were loyal to the king. And they would say only glowing things about the king. 
They would write things about the king saying, oh, the king is fantastic, the king can do no wrong. Had sliced bread been invented as of 1763, I'm sure, the Britain would have reported that the king was the greatest thing since sliced bread. That's all they could say were nice things about the king because they were written by the king's people. Well, John Wilkes decided to buck that trend and he started his own weekly circular called the North Britain. The North Britain took a different angle. The North Britain took the angle that it was supposed to be in the interest of the people that he reported the news and that he made commentary. And so in the North Britain, John Wilkes would occasionally be so bold as to criticize or question King George III and the actions of him and uh, of the king and, and of the king's ministers. Now, this proved problematic for some in the administration of King George III. The last straw seemed to come with the publication of the 45th edition of the North Britain, North Britain number 45. When North Britain number 45 was released, the king and his ministers went crazy. Before long, John Wilkes found himself arrested. John Wilkes found himself subjected to a very invasive search pursuant to a particular type of warrant that had become, unfortunately, all too common in that era, a type of warrant that we'll refer to as a general warrant. Rather than naming a particular place or a particular person where things would be searched and seized, this warrant simply identified an offense and said go after anyone and everyone who might in some way be involved in it. It gave unfettered, unlimited discretion to those executing and enforcing this warrant as to how and where and with respect to whom this warrant might be executed. And so they went through his house, even though he wasn't named in the warrant, even though his home, his address were not identified in the warrant, they searched through everything. John Wilkes was understandably outraged by this, as were people throughout the city of London when they became aware of it. John Wilkes, while in jail, decided that he was going to fight back. He fought in open court the terms and the conditions of his arrest, and he ended up fighting against this general warrant. He eventually won his freedom, and over time, he was re-elected repeatedly to Parliament. In time, he also brought a civil suit against King George III's ministers who were involved in the execution of this general warrant, and he won. He was awarded 4,000 pounds, which was a very substantial sum of money at the time, and the other people who were subjected to the same type of search under the same general warrant were also awarded a, a recovery under this same theory to the point that in present day terms, there were many millions of dollars that had to be paid out by King George III and his ministers to the plaintiffs who sued under this theory that they were unlawfully subjected to a search under a general warrant. In time, the number 45, in connection with uh, uh, the North Britain number 45, the publication that had sparked this whole inquiry, the number 45 became synonymous with the name John Wilkes. And the name John Wilkes, in turn, became synonymous with the cause of liberty. People throughout Britain and throughout America would celebrate the cause of freedom by celebrating the number 45. It was not uncommon for people to buy drinks for their 45 closest friends. It was not uncommon for them to write the number 45 on the side of buildings, taverns, saloons. It was not uncommon for the number 45 to be raised in connection with cries for the cause of liberty. So the number 45, the name John Wilkes, and the cause of liberty all became wrapped up into one. And it was against this backdrop that the United States was becoming its own nation. When it did become its own nation, when we adopted a constitution, and when we decided shortly thereafter to adopt a Bill of Rights, one of the very first amendments we adopted was the Fourth Amendment. And the Fourth Amendment responded to this particular call for freedom 
by guaranteeing that in the United States we would not have general warrants. The Fourth Amendment makes that clear. It contains a particularity requirement stating that any persons or things subjected to a search warrant would have to be described with particularity. The persons would have to be identified, or at least an area or, or a set of objects would have to be identified, rather than the government just saying, go after anyone and everyone that might be connected with this offense or, or with this series of events. At that time, there were no such thing as telephones. Those wouldn't come along for a very long time. They certainly didn't imagine, could, and could not have imagined, the type of communications devices that we have today. Nevertheless, the principles that they embraced at the time are still valid today. They're still relevant today. The principles embodied in the Fourth Amendment are still very much applicable today. And the freedom that we embraced then is still embraced today by the American people, who, when they become aware of it, tend to be offended by the notion that the NSA can go out and get an order that requires the providers of telephone services to just give up all of their data, give up all of their calling records, to give those over to a government agency who will then put them into a database and keep track of where everyone's telephone calls have gone. The idea behind this program is to build and maintain a database storing information regarding each call you have made and each call that has been made to you, what time each call occurred and how long it lasted. This is an extraordinary amount of information. Information that, while perhaps relatively innocuous in small pieces, when put together in a single database, one that includes potentially more than 300 million Americans, one that goes back five years at a time, can be used or could easily be abused in such a way that would allow the government to paint a, a, a painfully clear portrait, a silhouette of every American. Some researchers have suggested, for example, that through metadata alone, it could be ascertained how old you are, what your political views are, your religious affiliation, what activities you engage in, the condition of your health, and all other kinds of personal information. One of the reasons this is distressing is that unlike a program that would involve listening to the content of your telephone calls, which of course is, is not at issue with respect to this program, all of this can be done with a high degree of automation, such that those intent on abusing it could do so with relative ease, with the type of ease that they wouldn't have access to absent this type of automation. Now, sometimes people are inclined to ask, where is the evidence that this particular program is being abused? What can you point to that suggests that anyone has used this for nefarious political purposes or for some other illegitimate purpose not connected with protecting American national security? I've got a few responses to that. First and foremost, we do need to look to the Constitution both to the letter and spirit of that founding document that has fostered the development of the greatest civilization the world has ever known. It is important for its own sake, simply because we have taken an oath to uphold, protect, and defend it as members of this body. The Constitution is an end unto itself. And it's important that we follow it, regardless of whether we can point to some particular respect in which this particular program has been abused. Secondly. Even if we assume, even if we stipulate for purposes of this discussion that no one within the NSA is currently abusing this program for nefarious political purposes or otherwise, even if we assume that no one within the NSA currently is even capable of abusing or, or has any inclination to abuse this program at any point in the future, I would ask the question, can 
we say that we're certain that that will always be the case. Who's to say what might happen a year from now, two years from now, five years from now, 10 or 15 years from now? We know, Mr. President, how these things happen. We understand something about human nature. We understand what happens to human beings as soon as they get a little bit of power. They tend to abuse it. Remember the investigation brought about by Senator Frank Church back in the 1970s? Senator Frank Church, when he investigated wiretap abuses, abuses of a technology that was still only a few decades old back in the 1970s when this occurred, the Church Committee concluded, among other things, that every presidential administration, from FDR through Richard Nixon, had abused our nation's investigative and counterintelligence agencies for partisan political purposes, to engage in political espionage. Every single one of those administrations, from FDR to Nixon, had done that. In that sense, Mr. President, we have seen this movie before. We know how it ends. We know that even though the people working at the NSA today might well have only the noblest of intentions, over time, these kinds of programs can be abused. And we know that a lot of people in America understand the potential for this abuse. Thirdly, Mr. President, I have to point out that the NSA currently is collecting metadata only with respect to phone calls. But under the same reading of Section 215 of the Patriot Act that the NSA has used to collect this metadata, a reading with which I disagree, and a reading with which the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit disagreed in its thoughtful, well-written opinion just about two weeks ago. Even though the NSA is currently collecting only telephone call metadata right now, there's nothing about the way the NSA reads Section 215 of the Patriot Act, which is incorrect, by the way, an incorrect reading, but there's nothing about that reading that would limit the NSA to collecting only metadata related to telephone calls. So who's to say that the NSA might decide tomorrow or next year or a couple years from now if we reauthorize this or at some point down the road within a period of reauthorization that the NSA won't decide at that point to begin collecting other types of metadata. Not just telephone call metadata, but perhaps credit card metadata, metadata regarding uh, people who reserve hotels online, regarding emails that people send or receive, regarding websites that people visit online, regarding online transactions that occur. Those are all different types of metadata. Now again, I, I disagree with the NSA's legal interpretation of Section 215 of the Patriot Act. I think they're abusing it. I think they are misusing it. I think they have dangerously misconstrued it, just as the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit concluded a couple weeks ago. But this is their interpretation. And if we reauthorize this, are we not, Mr. President, reauthorizing in some respects, or at least enabling them to con continue this? I don't think we're validating or ratifying uh, what, what they're doing. Their interpretation of it is still wrong. But we're enabling them to engage in a continued, ongoing practice of abuse of the plain language of Section 215, which requires that anything they collect be relevant to an investigation. Well, their interpretation of relevant to the investigation is we might at some point in the future deem this material relevant to what we might at some point in the future be investigating. That cannot plausibly, under any interpretation of the word relevance, be acceptable. And it was on that basis that the Second Circuit rejected the NSA's interpretation. In any event, that same interpretation will still be the NSA's interpretation if, in fact, we reauthorize this. And there's nothing stopping the NSA from using that same interpretation, mistaken interpretation, but an interpretation nonetheless, of Section 215 in a way that would allow, there's nothing stopping them from using that same misinterpretation of the statutory language for the purposes of gathering metadata on credit card usage, on online activity, on emails sent and received. And from that, Mr. President, you can discern even more information about a person's profile. You can come up with a really frighteningly accurate picture of anyone based on that kind of metadata, just as you can now. But that would give them an even clearer picture. That would be an even greater affront 
to the privacy interests of the American people. All of this relates back to the idea that the government shouldn't be able to go out and say, here's a court order. We want all of your information. We want all of your data. Just give it to us, because we might want it later. This type of dragnet operation is incompatible with our legal system. It's incompatible with hundreds of years of Anglo-American legal precedent. It's incompatible with the spirit, if not the letter, of the United States Constitution. And it's not something that we should embrace. At the end of the day, we need to do something with this program. Not everyone in this chamber agrees on what that something is. And not everyone in this chamber who believes that we need reform, who believes that the NSA's program of bulk metadata collection is wrong, agrees on the same solution. But the way for us to get to a solution must involve open, transparent debate and discussion. And it absolutely should involve an open amendment process. So if there are those who have concerns with the legislation passed by the House of Representatives last week by a vote of 338 to 88, I welcome their input. I welcome any amendments they may have. I welcome the opportunity to make the bill better, to make it more compatible with this or that interest, to make it do a better job of balancing the privacy and national security interests at stake. But we have to have that debate and discussion. We have to have that process in order for the American people to be well represented and well served. We cannot continue to function by cliff. Government by cliff is a recipe for disaster. Government by cliff results in a take it or leave it, one size fits all, binary set of choices that disserve the American people. Government by cliff all too frequently results in temporary extensions rather than some type of lasting legislative solution that can help the American people feel more comfortable that they are being well represented. And so I would ask my distinguished colleague, my friend, the junior senator from Kentucky, if there are not ways in which we could come to an agreement on this. If we as a body couldn't come to an agreement on how best to resolve this difficult circumstance, if the cause of protecting American national security is irreconcilably in conflict with the privacy interests that are part of the Fourth Amendment, and most importantly, I would ask my friend from Kentucky, if privacy isn't, in fact, part of our security rather than being in conflict with it. I'd be interested in any thoughts my friend from Kentucky might have on that issue. Well, Mr. President, the uh, senator from Utah makes uh, a very good point and also asks some very good questions. In saying that we tend to work against deadlines here. I often say we lurch from deadline to deadline, and the American people wonder, what the heck have we been doing in between the deadlines? The Patriot Act has been due to expire for three years. It's on a sunset of three years. So we knew three years ago that this date was coming. There should be plenty of time, and I think adequate time, particularly to discuss issues that affect the Bill of Rights, that affect uh, rights that were you know, encoded into our Constitution from the very beginning. So I think without question, the issue is of great importance and that we should debate it. But too often, budgetary measures, or maybe this measure, get so crowded up against deadlines that people are like, oh, we don't have time for amendments. The problem is if you don't have amendments, you're not really having debate. And I think the senator characterized very well that we both agree that the bulk collection of data is wrong. We think that that goes against the spirit and the letter of the Constitution. However, at least half of us that we will encounter in this body don't even agree with that supposition. They believe, as many of them have pointed out, we're not collecting enough. And they don't care how we collect it, let's just collect more. So we are on different sides of opinion, two groups here. And then some of us aren't exactly on the same page as to the solution, but we agree on the problem. 
I think you could work through to the solution if you all agreed that it's a problem and that the American people think we've gone too far. And I think that's what the purpose of some of this debate today is, is hopefully to draw the American public in and have them call their legislators and say, enough's enough. You shouldn't be collecting my data unless you suspect me of a crime, unless my name is on the warrant, unless you've had a judge sign the warrant for me. You shouldn't be collecting, collecting all the data of all Americans all the time. And I think part of our problem is the deadlines. And part of the reason I'm here today is that I've been working on, you know, five or six amendments for a year now with Senator Wyden. So we have bipartisan support for a series of amendments. These are what we think would be best to fix this problem. Certainly, when we've had three years to wait for this moment, we ought to have enough time to vote on five or six amendments, you know. And so that's really, I think, what we're asking of the leadership of both sides is permission, because really in this body, everybody's got to agree to let you vote on something or no votes happen. We have done a better job this year. We are voting on more amendments, but this is still one of those occasions where we're butting up against a deadline. And my fear is that without extraordinary measures, which I'm hopefully trying to do today, that we may not get vote on amendments and we may not get adequate time to debate this, I think, important issue. Some of the uh, amendments that uh, we've been interested in presenting as a way to fix this. So first you have to agree to what the problem is. We think the problem is that the government shouldn't collect all of your phone records all of the time without putting your name on a warrant, without telling a judge that they have suspicion that you've committed a crime. We think that collecting everyone's phone records all the time without suspicion is sort of like a general warrant. It's like a writ of assistance. It's like what James Otis fought against. It's what John Adams said was the spark that led to the American Revolution. So we think that the American people also believe this, that the American people believe that their records shouldn't be collected in bulk, that there should not be this enormous gathering of our records. What we need to do is get to a consensus where everybody agrees that that's a problem. But the body is still divided. About half of the Senate believes that we should collect more records, that we're not invading your privacy enough, that privacy doesn't matter, that by golly, let's let the government collect all of your records to be safe. But when the Privacy Commission looked at this, when Senator Wyden looked at this, and with other people who have the intimate knowledge looked at this, their conclusion was that the bulk collection of our records, this invasion of privacy, isn't even working that we aren't capturing terrorists that we wouldn't have caught otherwise by this information. So even the practical argument that says, we'll give up our privacy to keep us safe, even that argument's not a valid argument. But we've been looking at some of the possible solutions for this, and I see uh, the senator from New Mexico, and we'd be glad to entertain a question if he has a question. Uh, 